teach in John 10. Let's start there. Um, I want to take for the, uh, an idea tonight at the moment when the world, the religious world, thought that Jesus had a demon. Um, this happens more than once in Jesus' ministry. I think it's intriguing when we see this because when I think of demonic manifestations or demonic possession, by the way, the, word, the phrase demon possessed is never found in the Bible, but when I think of demonics or spirits um, and manifesting themselves, you're probably like me. You, you kind of think in the, the, the lines of what almost seems like a seizure, some sort of physical release, some shaking, some sort of violence, some sort of uh, expulsion from the body. Um, I don't assume for a moment that Jesus walked around shaking or expelling things from his mouth or falling down on the ground and... and flopping around. So what caused the religious world of Jesus' day to think he had a demon? I mean, if, if, if our idea of demon possession is in the manifest and only in the physical, then what would Jesus have possibly done? Well, I think it goes without saying that it's not manifesting in the physical. It doesn't have anything to do with it because we don't see that from Jesus and we're not to make that assumption from Jesus. So that leads me to this question. What was Jesus teaching? What was Jesus saying that would cause the religious world of his day to think that, that he had a demon. Now, before we get any farther, I just want to point out that a lot of times when you start to go down new roads, theologically, when you start to go into areas of, of understanding the revelation of God's love or his grace that maybe you didn't have before, that your peer group didn't have, that your church group didn't have, a lot of people will tell you that you're deceived by the devil and you're being listening to doctrines of demons. And they'll even say something like, I think devils, I think you're listening to the devil. I think demons have got a hold of you. I'm not so sure you're not demon possessed. And I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that. I have. And you hear it from people who are, you don't hear it from lost people. You hear it from religious people who think you've left their train of thought. You've left their way of thinking. There must be something wrong with you. Well, I want to start by saying that you're in good company if religious folks once in a while question your theology to the point that they think you might be demon possessed. Because that was Jesus. And we're followers of Jesus. And I'm not telling you you got to go out here and uh, have someone accuse you of being demon-possessed. But my point is that what, what the religious world often attributes to the work of the devil, they do so because they're seeing something they've never wrestled with or that they don't understand. Or they're seeing something that is so outside the norm of what they think in regards to how God works that they can't possibly be wrong about how God works. What you're saying just must be inspired of the devil. That's always an interesting rebuttal to something you don't understand. Like, I don't understand what you're saying. You must be demon-possessed. Because I've got such a good ear in the spirit that I know if it's of God, I'd have already got it. And so if I haven't got it yet, then that must be of the devil. And so we, from that baseline understanding, let's take a look at Jesus who on more than one occasion gets accused of being demon-possessed. I want to say that again. The Lord Jesus Christ on more than one occasion gets accused of being demon-possessed. And he's not flopping on the floor, and he's not screaming and running around cutting himself. He's just talking. He's just talking, and he gets accused of being demon-possessed. So what would he have possibly said that freaks out the religious mind so much that they, they close their own ears to the sound of the Father's voice and accuse the Son of God of being possessed of devils. And so that's what we want to dig into. We want to do it in the book of John. I love John. I love John's narrative, and there's a couple reasons. We always call John the non-synoptic gospel. We do that because he's not similar to the other three. John stands alone. Let me give you a real quick rundown as to why John stands alone. John is showing you a Jesus that is basically being presented through the post-judgment motif. And what I mean by that is Jesus doesn't have judgment prophecies in the book of John. Jesus doesn't have an eschatology in the book of John. Jesus doesn't have a hell in the book of John. Now, you, you might say, well, that's just John trying to show another side of Jesus. But it's also interesting that John is the last gospel penned. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are already in the books, so to speak, when John writes this gospel about Jesus, and he doesn't bother to give the nativity. He doesn't bother to give the early little boy Jesus. He just jumps out of the gate with a recreated book, in the beginning, God, in the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Sounds just like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And John, from the opening shot, lets you know, I'm writing a brand new Genesis. I'm writing a brand new beginning. And in this story, God as light becomes life, becomes man, and becomes the one man. The first man messed it up. The last man's going to get it right. God manifests himself in the flesh and becomes man. And then the whole story of Jesus, there's, there's this incredible intimacy with the Holy Spirit. There's no other gospel account in which puts the Holy Spirit front and center like John. And I what I meant by a post-judgment motif is that Jesus comes along in John and repeatedly says, I didn't come to condemn. I didn't come to judge. My father isn't going to judge. My father put judgment into my hands. Now is the judgment of this world. And if I be lifted up, I'll draw all to myself. Now is the prince of this world judged. Over and over and over in John, his judgment is not in the far off future in the year 2022 or the year 3022 or the year 10,000. In John's gospel, his judgment is at a place called Calvary. I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you and then I'm going to come bring you back to myself. And he's not talking about vanishing, going over into the glory land. He's talking about going into the heart of the earth and dying and coming back on the other side of a resurrection and receiving us into himself. He says, because if I don't, you'll be orphans. And how many of you know you're not an orphan? And the reason you're not an orphan is not because the, the quote unquote rapture has happened. The reason you're not an orphan is because the resurrection has happened and Jesus has come give you the Holy Spirit so that you belong to the family. If it weren't for John, you wouldn't have that Jesus. Thank God for John. That's the message of this fantastic book that tries to lay out a Jesus that puts judgment at Calvary so that you and I can live with him in a resurrected reality. And so when you get to the theology of John, Man, you are looking at deep Jesus theology because you're looking in a post-judgment world at a resurrected Christ. In essence, even though he hasn't yet resurrected in these stories, John's writing it from that point of view. Let me tell you what the Jesus will say that's going to take the judgment into himself. What's his message he's going to give to his church? What's his message he's going to lay out in front of them? I want to begin in John chapter 10. I want to read for you verse 20. Because I want you to see their accusation. And the accusation sounds like this. Many of them said he has a demon and he is mad. Some translations say he is insane. Some translations say he is deluded. Some translations say he is crazy. No matter how you translate it, mad, deluded, insane, and crazy ain't good. Right? right? None of you want to be mad, deluded, insane, or crazy. And what do they accuse Jesus of? Mad, deluded, insane, and crazy. But what do they really accuse Jesus of in verse 20? He has a demon. There's the accusation. So I, my exploration tonight is what did Jesus have to say to get them to the place that they would say he has a demon, he has, he's demon-possessed. And I would say, based upon the fact that if you'll just glance, maybe you're looking at a hard copy, and if you are, there's a good chance that the words are written in red. And if you look at your hard copy and just glance backward, most of chapter 10 is written in red up till this point, which means that most everything in those first 20 verses are Jesus talking. Which tells me that whatever, it's not how Jesus acted that made them think he was demon possessed. It's what Jesus said that made them think he was demon possessed. So guess what we're going to do tonight? <laughs> we're going to investigate what is it that Jesus said that led to the accusation he's demon possessed. Because this must be, I don't think I'm overstating this. This must be world changing stuff. I mean, whatever's right here in John 10, it's so big that the religious world of Jesus' day would go, only a demon would say that. That's insanity. That can't be the God we know. That can't be the God we serve. So let's start from the top with Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 1, and I'm going to warn you that for the first six verses, I'm going to give you no commentary. All right? We're just going to talk as Jesus talked. And I'm going to show you why we're not going to give any commentary. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, that same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. I stop here because according to the author, John, verse 6 says, written in black, Jesus is no longer talking. 
But the narrator, John, tells us that no one that Jesus spoke to in the first five verses had any idea what he was talking about. Okay? So, because of that, Jesus turns around in verse 7 and explains himself. So here's how I want to handle this. Who is Paul White to stand up here tonight at this church and bother to try to explain Jesus' first five verses when no one 2,000 years ago had any idea what Jesus was talking about in those first five verses? So Jesus himself gives him his own commentary on his own first five verses. So we're going to just work our way right on into verse 7 where Jesus starts an audio commentary on his first five verses of John 10. Confused yet? I hope not. I hope I said that just right. Let's don't bother with the first five verses. Let's let Jesus explain the first five verses. And where do we do that? John chapter 10, verse 7. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Okay, time out. All you got to do from here on down is take everything Jesus says and go plug it back into the first five verses. Jesus is giving you his own course in how to interpret his teaching. Because here's what it said in verse 1. I say to you, he, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up another way, is a thief and a robber. Verse 7, I say to you, I'm the door. Okay, so Jesus has put himself into the story and said, I am the door, which means that if you're going to come in, you're going to come in through the door named Jesus. Well, my great question is, if you're going to come in where? Because how we preach this is, if you're going to get into heaven, you're going to get in through Jesus. Is that what Jesus said? No. Okay, well that tells me that maybe we should stop teaching this as a script. If you want this to be about heaven, fine, but don't put words into Jesus' mouth. Fair enough? You want this to be about heaven, great. But don't proclaim it as if that's how Jesus taught it. Because you actually have a commentary in John 10 of what Jesus was teaching. You don't have to guess. You actually have Jesus telling you, here's what I mean when I say what I say. And let me warn you, what he means when he says what he says made him think he was demon possessed. <laughs> yeah. We're all on the same page. We're, yeah. we're just wor slow working our way into this. Just let Jesus' words sort of fall out there by themselves. And so what's the first thing you learn about the story? Christ is the door. Whatever's on the other side of the door, you're not getting that unless you come in through Jesus. The other side of the door then must really matter. And so Jesus proclaims himself to be the door. Verse 8, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Let me say that again. All who ever came before me not were thieves and robbers. Present tense verb in the Greek. All who ever came before me are currently thieves and robbers. Everyone who came before me. Who came before Jesus? All these guys. See this part right here, this big old fat part we call the Old Testament? All of them came before Jesus. Is all all? We did, the, we did a little bit of this last night. Let's try it again. Does all mean all? Okay, so if all that came before me are thieves and robbers, not just were thieves and robbers, but are currently thieving you and robbing you, then everybody not named Jesus has an agenda in your life. Everybody not named Jesus has something to steal from you. Your money, your hopes, your dreams, your passions, your glory, your stuff, your innocence, whatever. I'm not making an accusation. I'm just quoting Jesus. Everybody else, he goes, will rob you. Everybody else will steal from you. Guess who qualifies as some of the robbers and the thieves? There you go. You got it. Everybody robbing and thieving if they're not named Jesus. All right. It's so much better when you're in the all and it's not them. Doesn't it just... You might as well just embrace it. Just put it on like a warm blanket. And you go, all means, all not all means some of those guys out there I disagree with. Or some of those religious people I don't like. Can you see why he's on his way to being called demon-possessed? 
Because ain't nobody in the world wants to be a thief and a robber that don't think they're a thief and a robber. Don't you accuse me of something I'm not guilty of. If I didn't do it, I'm not going to stand right here and have you accuse me of that. And Jesus has opened up with, everybody, not named me, is a thief and a robber. And they're robbing you of something in your life. The sheep won't hear them. I'm the door. Doubles down on that. Verse 9. He already told you that in verse 7. I'm the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be saved. Here comes the answer to what's on the other side of the door. He will go in and he will go out. And he will find pasture. Is that heaven? Once you die in this realm, go into the, the, the next realm. You don't come back into this realm, right? You're done. Once the terrestrial is done, you go be the celestial. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Once this old man goes back to the dirt, you pick up the celestial man. You don't go in and out into glory. So we must not be talking about heaven. Because whatever's on the other side of that door, you go in and out. Whatever, whatever I'm getting in over there, I go in and out. I think this is, this is amazing. Jesus says, I'm the door. Sheep hear me. Everybody else is thieving and robbing you. You get to come in through me and you get to go in and out and you get to find pasture because in Christ, he gives you freedom of mobility and freedom of spiritual diet. He allows you to be you to move about the cabin, so to speak, and to take him with you everywhere you go, not only to come and meet him here or wait for him over in the glory land, you come in and out, in and out in Jesus. I didn't say saved and lost, saved and lost. That's not what Jesus said. He said they're saved and they get to go in and out. Did you hear that? It's his words. They're saved and they go in and out. Wherever they go. They get to go there because they know the door. Whatever they do, they have the door in their heart. The way into the Father goes in and out with them. Yeah. This is incredible to me yeah. that Jesus is presenting himself as the access point to the green pastures. Yeah. They'd been singing that little song their entire lives. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. I don't know what their melody sounded like. The book of Psalms only includes lyrics. It doesn't include notes. But they sang it. And their entire life they sang, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Whatever it sounded like, that's what they were waiting for. Somebody's going to lead me in and out. Somebody's going to take me where I need to go. Somebody is going to be my shelter. Somebody is going to give me something good to eat. Somebody is going to water my soul. Somebody... Who is the somebody? Jesus said, it ain't these guys. They're thieves and robbers. He goes, but I'm here to show you the door, the only way in and out, the only way to find pasture in him. The thief does not come, verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I want to step out here for a moment. And I want to present to you that I think John 10.10 10 is one of the most important verses in the entire New Testament. I think it's also one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire New Testament because most everybody, and I'm not pointing any fingers in this room, but I'm just saying to most people watching or most people listening, all of us at one point or the other have tried to figure out who this figure Satan is or the devil is. We've got these spiritual images about what he is. And a lot of us will say the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, right? We say that a lot. In fact, that's one of the descriptions people give of the devil. What's the devil like? Well, the Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I'm here to present to you the Bible does not say any such thing. This scripture never mentions the devil. This scripture never mentions Satan. It says the thief. Now, let's stop there for a moment and try to figure out who the thief is. Abe's a half a step ahead of me. All who came before me, he said, are thieves and robbers. If it ain't named Jesus, what is it? Thief and a robber. Jesus in John 10, 10 says, The thief only comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. And so what I believe Jesus is saying, and this is what gets him an accusation of being demon-possessed, is he goes, look around at the leadership that's been trying to tell you how to get in the door. Look around at the gatekeepers of spiritualism. 
at the ones who tell you how to receive God's favor. The ones that say they're feeding you green grass and fresh water. Take a look at all of the people around you who've been holding your, proverbially holding your hand while all the time smacking you with rods of iron and knocking you down. He goes, every single one of them are here to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't blame that on the devil when you've got plenty of religion to do it for you. And not just religion, but anything and everything that tries to take the shine off the penny that is Jesus. It tries to take the luster off of the finished work of Christ. That's a thief. And they're robbing you. And they're robbing your joy. And they're stealing your hopes and your dreams. And they're squashing you down under somebody else's idea of what it means to grow or be spiritual or be anointed. And you can come up with all of your verses and quote them like little poems and do your little jigs across platforms and still rob people of the very life that Jesus said that he came to give. He said, because a thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, contrast it. But I have come that they might what? Have life. Not life after they die. I'm a door. They get to come in now, not when they're dead. That they could have life and that they could have it what? More abundant. And you know what that word is? That they could have super abundant life. When you meet Jesus, you come into the door that is Jesus, and unfortunately you got to step over a bunch of thieves and robbers to get there. But when you get there, He becomes your diet. He becomes your sustenance. He becomes your hope. And you have life. And you have it more abundant. Because you've met the life giver. And he doesn't hold you in chains in some religious performance. He lets you go in and out. He lets you go in and out and live your life. And when you go, he goes with you. He doesn't isolate himself in church and say, I'll be here, go live right, come back. The glory will fall next week. No, when you go, he goes. Wherever you go, the shepherd goes with you. And he walks you into the green pastures and he walks you beside the still waters. And he says, son, daughter, I want you to go live. I want you to, as Peter said in 1 Peter 3.10, love life and see good days. I didn't even know that was in the Bible for the first couple decades of my life. That the Bible says, for he who would love life and see good days, refrain your tongue from speaking evil. You want to enjoy life? Stop judging everything that walks past you by open flapping your gums at things and people you don't understand. That's a first step to loving life because you're going to be miserable and hate life every time you got to identify what's wrong with everybody you ever pass. You ever tried to live that way? Everybody you pass, you can figure out what's wrong with them. That's a way to hate life. And that's also why you end up going, I hate this place so much I can't wait to go home be with Jesus. Because you think Jesus is over there and you're over here. And if you just had him in here, maybe you could love some life and see good days. But as long as you spend all your time speaking evil against anything, everything, and everybody, there's no way you can love life. And that's why we can't wait to get home. I was raised in the church. Every time I went to church, people talked about going home. But it was never because that home was so much better than their home at their house. It was because this was a hell hole and they needed to get out of here, away from all these sinners, so they could go be around people that didn't sin anymore. (laughs) It's also why when you preach a Jesus that loves people, people think you're demon-possessed. They thought Jesus was demon-possessed. What's the difference? Jesus loved everything he encountered. Put his arms around them. Healed the leper. Raised the dead. He's demon possessed. You know why he's demon possessed? He's demon possessed because he called us thieves and robbers. We're Sabbath keepers. Honor the feast days. Keep the Torah. Pay our tithes. Honor the priesthood. Listen, everything I'm telling you Good, good Torah believers. That's exactly what they would have said. We're doing all this stuff right. You come along and tell us you're the only way in. We're thieves and robbers? You call me a thief and a robber? I'm out here doing good for God. You're in here eating with publicans and sinners. You're a glutton and a wine-bibber. These are the accusations made about Jesus. You know why they called him a glutton and a wine-bibber? Because he ate in public and he drank wine. And they went, glutton and wine-bibber. That's not how a man of God ought to carry himself. Glutton and wine-bibber. 
And you're calling me a thief? This is the response you get. Yeah. See, I've been cut down for, for, for telling people that God loves them. And the scripture that Abe quoted, probably the most overlooked scripture in the Bible, love covers a multitude of sins. We don't even preach that. Because quite frankly, we don't even agree with it. Because I've heard preachers say, nothing, you can't cover sin. God's in the sin exposure business. God's not in the cover business. And you could put a scripture up on the PowerPoint right behind him. Love covers a multitude of sins. It would be one of those great opposite moments where the, the scripture doesn't go with the sermon. But we don't even think that's in the Bible. Love covers a multitude of sins. Why? Wow, I could preach a loving God and be accused of being led by doctrines of devils because the love of God actually puts religion under conviction. Because if you preach the love of God, then you're preaching that God's love is enough. That that's what we ought to be presenting to people instead of their performance or what they do, but pouring the love of God onto them so that God can move in, can show them that he's moved into that prison, into that hell, and do his work. And it puts us under a conviction because we don't, we, we're trying to specialize in interpersonal judgment. And when you specialize in interpersonal judgment, you can only do it from the point of self-righteousness. You can't do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because, by the way, the Holy Spirit will not help you to walk up and point out people's sins. Because the love of God covers a multitude of sins, the Holy Spirit can only witness what he saw at Calvary. What he saw at Calvary was God take the sins of the world into himself and reconcile the world back to himself. So the Holy Spirit would have to lie about what he saw at Calvary to go out and point out other people's sins through your prophetic utterance. So let me tell you who's being led of a devil. When you walk into a room and start pointing out people's sins, the only way you can do that is through the utterance of the doctrines of devils because the Holy Spirit won't help you. It's illegal in the kingdom of God to prophesy any way but to exhort, to uplift, to comfort, and to edify. Illegal. The Holy Spirit cannot be party to it. So you want to be in the sin pointing out business? You're going to have to be demon possessed. Ooh. Now, I didn't say, I, when I say demon-possessed, I don't mean it the way you're thinking it. All right? Flopping out on the floor, stuff coming out of your mouth. You're going to have to be led by the spirit of the devil in the way that the religious leaders thought Jesus was being led when he proclaimed himself to be the door and the way in and out to find pasture and everybody else is thieving you and robbing you, Jesus goes. And they go, that's a devil. Only the devil will tell you that, that what we're doing is thieving and robbing you. So I just want to ask, what were they bringing to the table they thought was so good? The thieves and the robbers of the day of Jesus were bringing religion to the table. They were bringing scripture to the table. They were bringing legalism to the table. They were bringing performance to the table. They were bringing Moses to the table. In the book of Matthew, Jesus said, the scribes and the Pharisees sat in Moses' seat. At another point, he says, I will not judge you. You have one who judges you. Moses and the prophets. He goes, you want judgment, just turn to Moses. Moses is in the judging business. If you want deliverance from judgment, turn to the cross, where the cross will be judged in your place. Yeah. Only there is the work finished. Only there do we find liberty and rest for our souls. So the reason I say John 10.10 10, may be one of the most misused verses is because we just keep putting that off on the devil, not realizing that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy means anyone who tries to supplant Jesus in my life. Anyone. Pastor, evangelist, church, devil himself. Anyone that tries to give me any other means of my righteousness, my anointing, my favor, my salvation that's not named Jesus Christ. That's a thief and a robber. I've robbed some people. I don't mean with a gun and stole their wallet, but I've robbed some Christians of their joy. Yeah. And I've thieved them of their dreams and their hopes. And I stole from them. Sometimes their money, yeah. their stuff. Because I convinced them that they had to do that. Right. That if they would do that, God would bless them. That if they would do that, God would break the curse that they're grandma ended up inadvertently putting on them because she she bought a dragon statue and put it on a shelf in her house and then that put a curse on the whole house and then all the kids are all making c's at school because that dragon's hanging over their head 
I don't even know where that came from. That just was <laughs> top of my head. And, and I got to, and, and to be that kind of thief, I got to ignore that when, I got to ignore the book of Galatians that says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because when he went to Calvary, he became the curse on our behalf. I got to ignore that to preach that other stuff to you. So you know what I'm doing? I'm thieving you and I'm stealing from you and I'm robbing you. And I had to go back and ask the Lord to forgive me. You want to talk about repentance? I had to repent from that. Father, I'm sorry that I pitched you as a malevolent, vengeful, angry God who cannot wait to get people back. And I ignored the finished work of the cross. Yes. And I ignored that what you said when you said that you have reconciled the world back to yourself and all you're waiting for is them to reconcile themselves back to you. That's what I should have been telling them. You're already reconciled. It's time for you to reconcile yourself. Father, forgive me. And I have to let go of that. I've been imprisoned in my own guilt, like we talked about last night. I've been imprisoned in my own condemnation. I had to let go of that. Second part of that, but I've come that you might have life, you might have more abundant. And so I want to live life now in a way that represents the fullness of God's love. So that when I encounter someone, they don't have to wade through Paul White's judgment to get to the love of God. Because I'm supposed to be living his life so abundantly for the simple fact that I'm not being thieved, stolen from, and robbed, destroyed. Because I'm not being stolen from, robbed, and destroyed, I live my life in a way in which I project the love of the Father onto my neighbor. Some of the things I think we've forgotten in Christianity is that what we're doing in following Jesus is not trying to live through a series of rules and jump through a bunch of hoops in order to do enough to get heaven in our life and avoid hell. What we're actually doing is expressing the love of the Father to the rest of his family that may not realize how much he loves them. And that's why loving our neighbor becomes crucial to being actual Christians. Let me say that again. Loving our neighbor becomes crucial to being actual Christians. The other stuff is thieving and robbing us of the life we ought to be living because all we're thinking about is dying and going to heaven. And so we ought to be living a life abundant so that we present the love of God to our neighbor rather than judge our neighbor in, out of hand because we are under some sense of obligation that it's our job to fill heaven. So scratch that. It is not your job to fill heaven. It is your job to fill up the hell of every person you meet with the heaven you've met in Jesus. That's loving your neighbor. So you wouldn't even have to have an impetus. You wouldn't even have to have a threat hanging over your head. You'd love them anyway. Why don't you commit adultery? If your answer is because the Bible says not to, try that out on your spouse. That's a poor excuse as far as your spouse is concerned. Try it out. Why don't you commit adultery? Because God said not to. Your, your spouse ought to get mad at you. That ought to lead to a fight. Because the reality is, is they want you to love them enough you don't commit adultery. Not scared God's going to get me if I commit adultery. See, that was a trap. And we all walk right into that one real easy because we forget that the purpose was so that we wouldn't crush the soul of our spouse, not because God is up there making arbitrary marriage laws. What do you really want you to do? Honor the people you love. Well, which one am I supposed to love? And that's been our trick question forever. And a guy tried that on Jesus. Which one's supposed to be my neighbor? And so Jesus gave the story of the Good Samaritan. Because the answer is, it's always going to be the last person you want it to be. And you learn to love them. And if you can't, and you go to God and say, teach me how loved I am so I can learn how to love people I can't stand. And part of the reason why we're so judgmental is nobody in the church is preaching to us that God loves us. And because we don't think God loves us, we've got to go out and beat somebody else up. Because yeah. if I'm going to go and get licked every time I go to church, bless God, I'm going to go out there and hit somebody else because it's the only way I can find any kind of self-approval to a God that doesn't accept me. Well, at least maybe I can live better than so-and-so. And we'll go find people living like hell to make us feel a little bit better about what we're living in. Yeah. Because no one's leading us in and out of the door yeah. where we get to find green pastures and still waters. And if they just would, if we could just introduce people to green grass and still waters and stop consuming ourselves with how they live, right. we're consumed with how people live. 
rather than who they're living it out with, Christ. If we'd become as consumed with the Jesus they know, we could watch heaven go to work on their hell. We could watch them have life and have it more abundant. You go, preacher, you're off your rocker. Good! That's where I want to land in this message because that's exactly where they end up with Jesus at the end of this sermon. They get to the end of it and they go, this guy's got a demon. You've got to be crazy to preach what he's preaching. You've got to be nuts off your rocker to preach what he's preaching. Good. Perfect. If you don't get that response when you get to the end of this, you're not preaching it right. That's my opinion, but I'm sticking to it. (laughs) You get to the end of this, you ought to be a little bit nuts. Because it's going to sound so opposite of how we've been taught to get in. And Jesus goes, I'm the door. I'm going to let you in. For all intents and purposes, I've given you the power of this. I've given you the meat of this. But let's land one more time on that 10th verse. I want to take you to the Apostle Paul real quick. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, destroy. I've come that you might have life. You might have it more abundant. Go to Romans 5 real quick. I just want to toss another verse or two at you. And I'm, I'm, we're going to go back to John. I, I, there's, there's a couple more things I want you to see. But, but I want you real quick to see Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith. Romans chapter 5. I know I moved there pretty fast. Let me slow down. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why we have peace with God? It's right there in the verse. Why are you at peace with God? Because you've been living right? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know everything you have, you have because of Jesus? You don't have one thing because you're a good boy. You don't have one thing because you're a good girl. It's because of Jesus. Get out of the good boy, good girl business. That ain't what the church is about. Come to ch- I want to clean up my life. I'm going to go to church. That's how people think. Yeah. I'm going to become a good boy. I'm going to start going to church. And we love that. We're like, you're right, man. You've got to come to ours, though, because we'll get you right. Those others will get you wrong. They'll mess you up. You've got to come down here. we really get you to live right. Everything you have, you have because of Jesus. You're justified by faith through Jesus Christ, through whom also, look at verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You say, see, pastor, the key is faith. You're right, it is. You want to stand in grace and enjoy life? You're going to do it through faith. You're going to have to believe this or you can deny this. That's your call. You believe this, you can have access into his grace and stand in faith. You don't believe it. You don't have any. You, you can't walk in what you don't believe. That's right. Yes. That, that's pretty simple, right? You can't walk in what you don't believe. You want to know why a lot of us have been walking in religion? Because it's the only thing we believed. Right. Why we've been walking in performance? Because that's all got preached to us. Why we're obsessed with hair and clothes and makeup, movies, because that's what we got up and preached. Yeah. We didn't get up and preached Christ and Him crucified. We got up and preached on what rating of movies okay. <laughs> we didn't get up and preached on the resurrection, empty tomb, power of the Holy Spirit, go out and love your neighbor. Instead, we got up and preached it on well, music, hip hop, rap, start talking about porn. Because yeah. we were so obsessed with what people do and what people don't do. That that become the impetus for every morality lesson, every sermon, every song. Instead of Christ, the access point, the door, the way in to everything God has. If I can get you to believe in Jesus, I'm not going to worry about what you do. Because if I believe if you ever get to see Jesus, the what you do starts looking more like Jesus. And quite frankly, what if it didn't start looking more like Jesus? I don't determine your salvation or your worth by what you look like or by what you do. It's all Christ. Go back to John 10. You enjoying yourself tonight? Man, if you're not, I am. I'll give you. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now get ready, because we've all known a bunch of hirelings. But a hireling... He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Now what we've done with verse 12 is we've ignored the fact that once in a while we're the hireling. 
<laughs> we ignore that. And what we do is we go straight to that wolf passage and tell people, listen, you keep listening to these wolf preachers, you're going to lose your salvation. You want to know why you're going to lose it? Because look at the last part of the verse. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. You want to know what's going to happen when the wolf gets a hold of you? You're not going to be part of the flock anymore. You want to know what happens when you keep listening to the message and the song of the wolf? He's going to snatch you up and pluck you right out of the flock of the family of God. Sounds familiar, right? That's how I used to would have preached that. So, man, you will watch out for the wolf preachers and wolf preachers that come in sheep's clothing. Be wolves. The point of the verse is not that people are wolves. The point of the verse is you got a bunch of people who will abandon you to the wolf because they don't introduce you to the door. Because the door is the way you get away from the wolf. The door is entrance into everything God has for you, and the only way in is Jesus. And if you'd introduce people to Jesus, they could escape the wolf. Whoever the wolf is, whatever the wolf is. And in case you want to know what the wolf is, everyone who came before me is a thief and a robber. I'm the door, Jesus says. But I don't want to just leave that there. What if they're right? What if, if you hang out long enough near the wolf, he's going to swallow up your salvation and you were saved one week and lost the next. And you need to come up here tonight and rededicate your life to the Lord, get resaved. Because you've been hanging out with the wolf. And bless God, it's easy then to go plowing through five nights of revival identifying all the wolves. What they look like, what they sound like, how they act. When what you could have done was just kept reading John 10. Because if you kept reading John 10, Jesus circles the wagons right back to the whole wolf passage in regards to how they get snatched up. Because the word that he uses in verse 12 when he says a wolf catches the sheep is a Greek word, harpazo. Harpazo is the word that is to snatch or to catch away. It's the word the Apostle Paul uses to describe the euphoria of a revelation we have in Jesus in that we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, caught up to meet Him as He is. Jesus uses it. And do you want to know where else Jesus uses it? Look at John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They know me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch, catch, harpazo them out of my hand. Look at that. What did he warn you about in verse 12? He did not warn you about the wolf in verse 12. He warned you about the hireling. Please, hear me. I'm going to say this again. You were not warned about the wolf in verse 12. Because if you're warned about the wolf, all you're doing is scared you're going to lose your salvation. You were warned about the hireling. The hireling is the one that points you to something not called Jesus and calls it good. Don't worry about the wolf. You want to know why? Because verse 28, I give them eternal life. They never perish. No, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. No wolf gets to catch my people. Aren't you glad for Jesus? Yes. No wolf gets to catch my people. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. Verse 29. And no one, he doubles down. No one is able to harpazo them out of my hands. No wolf. Nobody. I'm the good shepherd, he says. I'm not scared of no wolf. That wolf can't get you. I hold you. My eternal life is your life. I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. But what about the wolf? The wolf can't snatch you out of his hand. No one can snatch you out of his hand. Let me tell you something. I am far more concerned in the church with hirelings that are keeping you away from the door than I am the wolf of the world. Because the wolf of the world can't snatch you out of his hand. Jesus doubled down, told you he couldn't. This world's got nothing on you. You're resurrected people. But the problem is, is we're not being led to the table that is green grass and still waters. We're not being led to the table that is Jesus. Because too often we have a hireling who's a thief and a robber that's stealing away from us the very essence of who Christ is. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. 
Pastor, what should we do with this? Go to the door. Go to the door. He stands at the door to the church at Laodicea, and he knocks. And he says, open the door, I'll come in, sup with you and you with me. That's not let me into your heart. This is fascinating to me. We've preached Jesus is standing at the door of your heart knocking. He wants to come in, be the Lord and Savior of your life. And the only place in the Bible that Jesus is knocking on the door is not to sinners. It's to the church. The seventh church of Asia in Revelation 3. There are, they're his church. So what's he knocking on the door for? Because he wants to remind you the way to intimacy is the door. You, you, you can get lost thinking the way to, to what you're supposed to be doing is building big buildings and what you're supposed to be doing is growing and what you're supposed to be doing is having bigger budgets and what you're supposed to be doing is influencing politicians and setting Supreme Court justice. What you're really supposed to be doing is intimacy with me. I'll eat with you, you'll eat with me. Just open a door, come in and out, find pasture. Everything else, a thief and a robber. We're being thieved, we're being robbed and stolen from by political thinking, ideological thinking, social thinking, yeah. governmental thinking. We've, we've thought that our answer is get the right politicians, get the right senators, pass the right laws, do the right thing. Christ is the door. Jesus is our answer. Everything, everything else is a thief and a robber. Right. Everything else will take the life right out of you and suck it dry until you walk into the church and leave more depressed than you walked in. Tired, worn out, beat up, taking sides, trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong. And there's Jesus standing there going, I'm the door. I've always been the door. I got fresh bread. Who wants some? Ignore the hireling. Quit getting scared of the wolf. No man snatch you out of my hand. Don't worry about the wolf. What I want you on guard for are people who won't let you in. Yeah. Watch out. You get to the end of that message and they go, this guy's got a demon. Right. So if you get to the end of this message and you go, this guy's got a demon, <laughs> I could do worse. At least I'm landing near Jesus. Truth of the matter is, is I just want you to see Jesus as the door, the hope for eternal life, present life, not excluded. Did you hear that? Present life, not excluded. You get to live his life now. Father, thank you. There's a lot more that we could say about you as a good shepherd, but I feel like tonight, Father, we've put a spotlight on Jesus. I hope that we haven't been so rambunctious and excited and put our own stuff out there so much that we've stood in the way in any way. If so, Father, forgive us where we've thieved and robbed. Help us get out of the way they can see Jesus is the door. And Father, help us to silence the voice of the hireling, the hireling that does not protect the sheep, that tries to provide an alternate way or tries to provide some other way. Help us, Father, to do as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.